The Pacific situation is now very grave, cabled President Roosevelt to Winston Churchill on the 9th of March 1942, the day after the surrender of Java. And so it continued for almost three months. Indeed, the situation was very grave everywhere. In Europe, Germany was preparing a spring drive through the Ukraine into the Caucasus. She might thrust on through Turkey and, with Rommel advancing from the west, take the Suez Canal. During the first three months of 1942, the Allies and neutral nations lost over two million tons of merchant shipping. During the second three months, over two million and a quarter tons, mostly in the Atlantic. In the Pacific, the Japanese now controlled all lands and waters between the Solomons and Burma and China, and everything north of Australia, excepting doomed Bataan, where they were closing in and the south coast of New Guinea, which would be their next objective. By agreement between the President and the Prime Minister, the 17th of March 1942, the United States assumed responsibility for the defence of the entire Pacific, including New Zealand and Australia, whither General MacArthur had to retire, while the British undertook to defend the Indian Ocean and the Middle East. The basic strategic plan of the war, to beat Hitler first, was confirmed. This meant that the United States was committed to a strategic defensive in the Pacific, but it was well understood by the President, the Prime Minister and the combined Chiefs of Staff that while forces were being trained and materials accumulated for a big offensive in Europe or Africa, the Pacific Theatre would have the highest immediate priority for ships, planes and troops in order to hold vital positions and protect communications. In the Roosevelt administration and in the armed forces, faith in eventual Allied victory never faltered. Yet, under the impact of defeat after defeat in the Pacific, unbalanced by anything hopeful in the Atlantic, many Americans began to regard the Japanese as endowed with fabulous fighting virtues and infinite military potentialities. Although this feeling was not very articulate, it made a dangerous culture bed for mischief-makers who demanded that defeat in the Atlantic be accepted, Europe be left to her fate, and American effort be concentrated in the Pacific. For the most part, however, the American people had confidence that leaders like Roosevelt, King, Nimitz and MacArthur would take the offensive against Japan when the time was ripe. In Japan, the early months of 1942 were pure sunshine, flushed with victories which had brought Hako Ichiu, the eight corners of the world under one roof, nearer accomplishment than at any time within recorded history. The Japanese warlords forgot, and the trusting people never knew, that Allied weakness was momentary, and that the superior strength of the Imperial Army and Navy could not long be maintained. As Admiral Hara, the carrier commander at Coral Sea, said, unprecedented success caused many officials in high positions in Japan to succumb to the so-called victory disease. People stricken with this malady predicted that American counterattack would develop slight strength and come too late, after Japan had organised her new acquisitions and obtained all the strategic materials that she needed. Plans for further expansion of the Japanese to the south and east naturally followed these false assumptions. Initial Japanese war plans were based on the assumption that it would take about five months to conquer the Philippines and Malaya, including the Netherlands East Indies. Logistics experts wanted six months more to get the oil fields operating again with production sufficient for war purposes. Now that the schedule of conquest had been halved and the scorched earth policy as to oil fields had failed, strategic planners believed they could step everything up. Moreover, these marvellous conquests had been cheap. Japanese losses up to the 1st of May 1942 comprised only 23 naval vessels, none larger than a destroyer amounting to but 26,441 tonnes. 67 transports and merchant ships totalling 314,805 tonnes. A few hundred planes and a few thousand soldiers and sailors. These fell so far short of the anticipated 20 to 30 percent naval losses that the younger and less far-sighted war planners could argue with some logic that they had surplus forces which could be used for further expansion while the earlier conquests were being developed and organised. Easy success, surplus forces and victory disease did not alter the basic Japanese strategy, but speeded it up. They encouraged the Japanese to extend their ribbon defence or defensive perimeter at once, instead of waiting until Greater East Asia was consolidated. Three new and successive conquests were anticipated. Number one. 
Tulagi and Port Moresby in order to secure air mastery of the Coral Sea and its shores. Number two, Midway Atoll and the Western Aleutians in order to strengthen the defensive perimeter and bring the United States Pacific Fleet to a decisive engagement. Number three, New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa in order to cut lines of communication between the United States and Australasia. The Battle of the Coral Sea came about because the Allies resisted point one, the Battle of Midway was the principal product of two, and three never came off. All three moves and more were in the Japanese Basic War Plan, which dates from 1938. The only new elements were shortening the timetable for two and three above, and the objective of a big fleet action. Admiral Yamamoto rejected the traditional Japanese naval strategy of keeping the fleet in home waters awaiting the enemy's arrival. He was bent on sailing out to seek action. For, he argued, if the combined fleet could annihilate our Pacific fleet and set up air patrols between Wake, Midway and the Aleutians, the Imperial Japanese Navy could cruise at will throughout the Pacific and land troops anywhere. This line of reasoning sounded correct to Japanese disciples of Mahan, and personally, I see nothing wrong with it. Japan had to smash the Pacific fleet in 1942 or sustain an irresistible counterattack in 1943-44. If that fleet had only consented to play the role assigned to it by the Japanese, they could have stretched their defensive perimeter to Hawaii without any weakening of their strength. Conversely, unless the Pacific fleet were knocked out, a mere strategic defensive behind the perimeter would avail nothing in the end, provided, of course, the American will to fight did not abate. The Coral Sea, appropriately named in 1803 by Captain Matthew Flinders R.N., is one of the most beautiful bodies of water in the world. Typhoons pass it by. The southeast trades blow fresh across its surface almost the entire year, raising whitecaps from the lee shores of the islands that build up to a gentle, regular swell that crashes on the Great Barrier Reef in a 1,500-mile line of white foam. There is no winter, only a summer that is never too hot. Almost all the islands on its eastern and northern edges, New Caledonia, the New Hebrides, the Louisiades are lofty, jungle-clad and ringed with bright coral beaches and reefs. Here the interplay of sunlight, pure air and transparent water may be seen at its loveliest. Peacock-hued shoals over the coral gardens break off abruptly from an emerald fringe into deeps of brilliant amethyst. Even under the rare overcasts that veil the tropical sun, the coral sea becomes a warm dove-grey in colour instead of assuming the bleak, foul-weather dress of the ocean in high latitudes. Here too, as at Rossell Island, are some of the last unspoiled island Arcadias, where a stranded sailor or airman might believe himself to be back in the Golden Age. Only in its northern bight, sometimes called the Solomons or the Bismarck Sea, does the Coral Sea wash sombre shores of lava and volcanic ash. That bight had been dominated by Japan since January 1942, from her easily won base at Rabaul. It was now time, in the view of her war planners, that she swing around the corner of New Guinea through the Louisiades and move into the dancing waters of the broad Coral Sea. If all went well, the next move would take the warriors of Japan to Noumea and the southern edge of the Great Barrier Reef, so that before the end of 1942 every shore of the sea would be in their possession or under their planes and guns. That is why the Coral Sea, where no more serious fights had taken place in days gone by than those between trading schooners and Melanesian war canoes, became the scene of the first great naval action between aircraft carriers. Japan's overall plan for Operation MO was so simple that it could be told in three sentences. With the cooperation of the South Seas Army Detachment and the Navy, we will occupy Port Moresby and important positions on Tulagi and in southeastern New Guinea. We will establish air bases and strengthen our air operations in the Australian area. Successively, an element will carry out a sudden attack against Nauru and Ocean Islands and secure the phosphorus resources located there. The phosphorus was wanted for Japanese agriculture. Port Moresby was the key to Papua, the tail end of New Guinea, and Papua must be secured in order to bring northern Australia within range of Japanese warships and bombers. The seizure of important points in the Australian area meaning presumably ports and airfields of northern Queensland down to Townsville, had been recommended but rejected. For as the situation developed, the Japanese decided that smaller and more easily acquired land masses such as Papua, the New Hebrides and New Caledonia, 
would serve equally well to control the Coral Sea, cut off and force Australia out of the war, hence the attempt to take Port Moresby by sea. Developed as an airbase, it would enable the Japanese Air Force to use heavy shelling against Allied supply routes and Darwinize the Queensland ports and airfields. The Japanese expected to run into opposition. They correctly estimated that about 200 Allied land-based planes were spotted on Australian fields and observed that American plane reconnaissance was so active extending even to Kavieng in New Ireland that the concealment of Japanese ship movements had become extremely difficult. They knew that Allied naval forces in the southwest Pacific were not large, but as they assumed only one carrier. Saratoga to be available, these forces were a little stronger than they expected. No very great force could be spared for Operation MO because Yamamoto's combined fleet was getting ready for midway. In mid-April, Admiral Nagumo's carrier striking force reached home waters after its Easter raid on Ceylon, with depleted air groups and ships badly in need of upkeep. Rear Admiral Hara's carrier division, Shokaku and Zuikaku, could, however, be readied in time, and a number of heavy cruisers which had done fine service in the Indies could be spared. The 4th Fleet, Vice Admiral Shigeyoshi Inouye, based at Truk and Rabaul, could furnish the rest. As finally constituted, Task Force MO comprised the Port Moresby invasion group of 11 transports carrying both army troops and a naval landing force, screened by a destroyer squadron, and a smaller Tulagi invasion group for setting up a seaplane base at Tulagi. Also a support group built around a seaplane carrier for establishing a seaplane base in the Louisiades, and a covering group consisting of light carrier Shobo, four heavy cruisers and one destroyer, commanded by Rear Admiral Goto, and finally the striking force of two big carriers, two heavy cruisers and six destroyers, commanded by Vice Admiral Takagi. Admiral Inouye, Commander 4th Fleet, who exercised the overall command from Rabaul, also controlled four submarines. The Naval Land-Based Air Force, which, though smaller numerically than the United States Army Air Force in northern Australia, was more mobile, but did not come under Inouye's command. Truk and Rabaul were the jumping-off places. Tulagi was to be occupied first, on the 3rd of May, then the support and covering groups and striking forces would cover the Port Moresby invasion group, which would leave Rabaul on the 4th and land a sizable army at Port Moresby on the 10th, a timetable that was never carried out. The Japanese expected the United States Navy and the Army Air Force to try to stop them, but the prior occupation of Tulagi and organisation there of a seaplane base would make it difficult for the Allies, from their nearest bases at Noumea and Port Moresby, to follow Japanese ship movements. So, once the Allied task force entered the Coral Sea, Admiral Inouye expected to catch and to destroy it by a pincer movement Goto on the west flank, Takagi on the east while the invasion group nipped through Jomard Pass into Port Moresby. Then, if everything went well, the carriers would proceed to smash up Allied planes and ships at the four Queensland bases, as they had done so successfully at Darwin. Finally, the Tulagi invasion group would move up to take Ocean and Nauru Islands. This complex Japanese plan illustrates a fundamental defect in Japanese naval strategy. Whenever the Japanese planners disposed of sufficient strength, they divided forces and drafted an elaborate plan, the successful execution of which required a tactical competence rare at any time in any navy, as well as the enemy's passive acceptance of the role he was expected to play. That sort of thing worked all right in the Netherlands' East Indies, where the Allied forces were heavily outnumbered, and it might have worked here too if the Allies had been surprised. But the Japanese were not sufficiently careful of security. Before the 17th of April, intelligence reached Commander-in-Chief, Pacific headquarters that a group of transports, protected by light carrier Shobo, and by a striking force that included two large carriers, would enter the Coral Sea and by the 20th Admiral Nimitz felt certain that Port Moresby was the destination, and that trouble would begin on the 3rd of May. Nimitz and MacArthur properly regarded this Japanese thrust as a major threat. Port Moresby was not simply a place to be denied to the enemy. It was essential for General MacArthur's strategic plans. He intended to develop this advanced outpost as a major airbase to block enemy penetration of Australia, and as a starting point for his return journey to the Philippines. 
Although it was clear that whenever battle was joined it would be in the southwest Pacific area on MacArthur's side of the line of demarcation, there was no question of handing the overall command to that distinguished general. According to the strategic arrangements made by the combined chiefs of staff in March, Commander-in-Chief, Pacific must exercise strategic control of any naval operation anywhere in the Pacific, but under no circumstances could he usurp MacArthur's strategic control of ground forces or land-based aircraft within the limits of the latter's command. No ground forces would be involved in this operation unless the enemy succeeded in landing at Port Moresby. But about 300 planes of the American Army and Royal Australian Air Forces were under MacArthur's command at Port Moresby, Townsville, Charters Towers and Cloncurry, Australia. Many were non-operational owing to shortage of spare parts. Others had to be used to defend Port Moresby and strike back at Ley and Raboul. Navy had only half a dozen Navy Catalinas based at Noumea. Thus, Nimitz could not control land-based air searches in this operation. But Inouye also had his troubles with the 25th Air Flotilla at Rabaul, as well as all seaplanes, which were under a separate and none too cooperative air command. In view of the inexperience of army flyers in overwater work, Nimitz expected to depend mainly on the air groups of Yorktown and Lexington, fewer than 150 planes, to frustrate the Japanese thrust. These carriers were already familiar with the Coral Sea. Lexington was a happy ship. Although commissioned as early as 1927, she still had a number of her original crew on board, and her air group included aviators already famous, such as John S. Tharsh and Butch O'Hare. Their example, as well as combat experience in the air battle of the 20th of February and the strike on Ley and Salamaua, made all new members of the crew proud to serve in Lady Lex, as they called her. Captain Frederick C. Sherman, her commanding officer, was a regular old sea veteran, who had taken up air warfare with great zest. Officers and men adored him. Rear Admiral Fitch, who relieved Wilson Brown on the flag bridge the 3rd of April, was the most experienced carrier flag officer in the Navy. Lexington, moreover, having left Pearl Harbor on the 16th of April after three weeks' upkeep there, was fresh and taut. Five days later, Commander-in-Chief, Pacific ordered Fitch to rendezvous with Fletcher on the 1st of May at Point Buttercup, west of the New Hebrides. Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher still commanded the Yorktown Task Force 17, then operating out of Noumea. On the 14th of April, this force was ordered to Tongatabu for replenishment and upkeep in preparation for a fight. Yorktown, the waltzing Matilda of the Pacific Fleet, had been doing turns with her consorts since the 14th of February, except for one week in the not very refreshing advanced naval base at Tongatabu. Her sailors felt that this dance marathon had lasted long enough and hoped they might continue eastward. But now they must take the old gal over to the Coral Sea and cut in on the Japanese. What else could Commander-in-Chief Pacific collect? Not Vice Admiral Pai's Task Force One, consisting entirely of pre-war battleships operating out of San Francisco. Nimitz at one time considered sending them out as a support force, but he could not spare the oilers to fuel them, and anyway they were too slow to keep up with fast-stepping flattops. Vice Admiral Herbert F. Leary, who became commander of the Southwest Pacific Forces, which absorbed the old Anzac forces, could and did contribute Task Force 44, commanded by that energetic warrior Rear Admiral J. G. Crace, R.N. At that time, the three Australian cruisers of this force were in Sydney. United States ship Chicago and Perkins were at Noumea. These two were ordered to join Fletcher on the 1st of May. Admiral Crace to rendezvous with the same Task Force commander in the Coral Sea on the 4th. There was a very slim chance of using Admiral Halsey, who blew into Pearl Harbour on the 25th of April in Enterprise with Hornet, after carrying Doolittle's Mitchells on the Tokyo raid. His Task Force 16 comprised half the Pacific Fleet's available carrier strength. Five days was the absolute minimum required for upkeep. The Coral Sea was about 3,500 miles away, and the battle was due to break on the 3rd of May. But the enemy might be delayed and Halsey might make it. Admiral Nimitz drew up his operation plan accordingly. The plan, completed by noon the 29th of April, simply stated that Admiral Fletcher as officer in tactical command over his own force, Fitch's and Crace's will operate in the Coral Sea commencing the 1st of May. The how was up to Fletcher. 
Cooperating Allied forces not under Fletcher's tactical command were Captain Christie's submarines based at Brisbane, which were to patrol the coastal waters of Papua, the Louisiades and the Bismarcks, and the Allied air forces under MacArthur's command, which were charged with air reconnaissance of the general area. Although the S-boat's movements were not coordinated with Fletcher's, they added Admiral Schema's flagship and a couple of Maris to the Allied bag before the Coral Sea operation was over. May Day 1942 was anything but cheerful for Admiral Nimitz. Coral Sea was on his hands, and something nasty was cooking for the Central Pacific, but he figured that there was time to stop the enemy in the south before deploying to defend the Hawaiian chain. The Australians, apprised of what to expect, saw no point in leaving their meagre garrison at Tulagi to be chewed up by the Japanese, and commenced evacuation of that important post in the Solomons on the same day. To know your enemy's intentions is fine, but such knowledge does not always mean that you can stop him. The solution of the problem in this case lay in applying fleet tactics employed during the first five months of the war, the surprise carrier raid. That was the basis of Nimitz's plan to stop Inouye. Admiral Fletcher was responsible for keeping his command ready for immediate action and for taking the offensive as soon as he received intelligence of Japanese ship movements, whether from Nimitz, MacArthur or his own pilots. As stated in his own Operation Order of the 1st of May, he was there to destroy enemy ships, shipping and aircraft at favourable opportunities in order to assist in checking further advance by enemy in the New Guinea-Solomons area. Fitch's Lexington force joined the Yorktown force and came under Fletcher's tactical command at 6.15 May 1st, at a position about 250 miles W by S of Espiritu Santo. Fletcher at once commenced fueling from Euler Neosho and directed Fitch to do the same from Tippecano at a point a few miles to the west and south, where Chicago and Perkins, which Admiral Crace had sent on ahead, were also to join and fuel. As usual in forces commanded by Admiral Fletcher, fueling was a very leisurely affair, and Fitch did not even start pumping until next day, at the end of which Chicago and Perkins, first to fill up, peeled off and steamed north to join Fletcher. Fitch, who appears to have been given a bad estimate of how long it would take, informed his OTC that the Lexington Group could not complete fueling until noon of the 4th. Fletcher, who was receiving intelligence from MacArthur about the approach of enemy forces, felt he could not afford to wait that long, and decided to steam out into the middle of the Coral Sea without Fitch or Crace, and try to ascertain the enemy's exact whereabouts by plane search. At 18, May 2nd he headed west at slow speed, leaving Fitch orders to rejoin him at daylight May 4th. By that time all Allied ships would be fueled, ready and in a position to intercept the enemy, at least so Fletcher estimated. The Japanese, however, pulled a surprise while Fletcher was a good 500 miles from Tulagi. At about the 8th of May 3, Admiral Shima's Tulagi invasion group made an unopposed landing on the beaches which United States Marines were to win back three months later. In support of the landing, Admiral Goto's covering group milled around south of New Georgia, with Admiral Marumo's support group 60 miles farther to the westward. But Admiral Takagi's big carriers, with which Fletcher eventually grappled, were well north of Bougainville, keeping out of Allied air search range and planning to enter the Coral Sea from the eastward on the 4th. The Port Moresby invasion group was still swinging around the hook at Rabaul. At 8 May 3rd, Fletcher and Fitch were about 100 miles apart and fueling, each unaware of what the enemy was doing, and each out of touch with the other. Fletcher was topping off his destroyers from Neosho, and Fitch was draining Tippecano to the last drop. The junior flag officer completed fueling at 13.10, 24 hours ahead of the predicted time, but he could not break radio silence to inform his senior of this important fact, and for some reason unknown made no attempt to send a message by airplane drop. Instead, he set a course immediately for the planned rendezvous with Fletcher next morning. Fletcher continued fueling destroyers from Neosho during daylight on the 3rd. Then, at 19, he received an intelligence report from MacArthur that gave him a hot foot. Australia-based planes had sighted two transports debarking troops off Tulagi and five or six Japanese warships between that place and Santa Isabel. This startling news brought an immediate change in Fletcher's plans. He directed Euler Neosho with destroyer Russell as escort to peel off and meet Fitch and Crace at the fueling rendezvous at the 8th of May 4 
and with them to proceed eastward to join him at a point about three hundred miles south of Guadalcanal, at daybreak the 5th of May. One hour and a half after obtaining the word he had been waiting two months to receive, Admiral Fletcher headed north at twenty-four knots, to which three more were soon added. He had determined to strike Tulagi with the planes of his one available carrier. The Japanese assumed, on the basis of their easy conquests in the Netherlands' East Indies, that once Tulagi was in their hands, no one would dare molest it. Consequently, Goto's and Marushiga's groups that had supported the operation retired at 11 May 3rd after the island had been secured. Hara's carriers were still north of Bougainville, flying off to Rabaul nine planes they had ferried down from Truk. The Port Moresby invasion group was still anchored at Rabaul, scheduled to leave at 18 next day. Only the ships of the Tulagi invasion force, and not all of them, were in the sound between Tulagi and Guadalcanal. Fletcher maintained his northerly course throughout the night, and by the 7th of May four arrived at about 100 miles southwest of Guadalcanal. About the same time, Fitch got the word from Neosho and Russell concerning his seniors' change in plans. At nine Crace's force, Australia, Hobart and Whipple joined him after an uneventful sail from Sydney. So, at this critical juncture, Fitch and Crace were about 250 miles south of Fletcher, unable to support him in case of need, and throughout the 4th of May, when Yorktown was launching and recovering planes, Fitch directed Lexington on a southeasterly course, increasing the distance between the two carriers. As Admiral Fletcher approached a launching position for his Tulagi strike, he ran into foul weather, which for carrier sailors can mean good fortune. The northern edge of a 100-mile-wide cold front which had moved up from Australia had now reached the north coast of Guadalcanal. The sky was overcast, rain squalls became frequent, and the southeast trade wind blew 25 to 35 knots. It was not good flying weather, but the cold front afforded Fletcher a curtain for his ships, and even for his planes until they came within 20 miles of Tulagi. There, fortunately for him, fair weather prevailed. At 6.30 May 4th, ten minutes before sunrise, Yorktown commenced launching an attack group of 12 TBD Devastator torpedo planes and 28 SBD Dauntless dive bombers. Next, a combat air patrol of six F-4, F-3 Wildcat fighters was put in the air. Cruiser float planes flew anti-submarine patrol. Yorktown had only 18 fighters operational and they had to be used for combat air patrol over the carrier, working in three shifts. Thus, the attacking bombers had only their own .30 caliber machine guns for protection if they ran into aerial opposition, but the risk had to be accepted. Each air squadron flew to the target and attacked independently, according to the naval air practice of those primeval beginnings of carrier warfare. Lieutenant Commander Birch's scouting squadron of SBDs arrived first over Tulagi and began its attack at 8.15. As usual throughout the war, the pilots overestimated what they saw. All their swans were geese, and all their geese, ducks or goslings. Admiral Shima's flagship, a fleet mine layer, they took for a light cruiser, the transport for a seaplane tender, the larger minesweepers for transports, and landing barges for gunboats. Only the two destroyers present were correctly identified. The scout planes dropped 13 1,000-pound explosives, damaging destroyer Kikuzuki so that she had to be beached, and in addition sending two small minesweepers to Davy Jones's locker. Lieutenant Commander Joe Taylor's torpedo planes came in five minutes later and launched 11 torpedoes, but only knocked off sweeper Tama Maru. Next, at 8.30, Lieutenant Short's bombers dropped another 15 1,000-pound explosives with possible minor damage to a couple of ships. All planes landed safely on board Yorktown at 9.31 and rearmed immediately for a second attack. As Birch said, not even time for the pilots to get a cup of coffee. This second strike, consisting of 27 SBDs, each carrying a half-ton bomb and 11 TBDs, commenced launching an hour after their return. They damaged a patrol craft and destroyed two seaplanes. The torpedo bombers came in through heavy anti-aircraft fire and everyone launched, but their score was zero, and one of them was lost on the return. As the pilots reported three more Japanese seaplanes anchored off Macambo Island in Tulagi Harbour, Admiral Fletcher sent up four fighter planes that afternoon to get them, which they did. The Wildcats then spotted destroyer Yuzuki steaming away, 
made four strafing runs on her, terminated the captain and many others, but the ship got away with only minor damage. As the planes were returning to Yorktown, two became separated from the rest and crash-landed on the south coast of Guadalcanal, but both pilots were rescued that night by destroyer Hammond. A third attack group of 21 SBDs launched at 14 dropped 21 more half-tonners, but sank only four landing barges. By 1632 all had returned to the carrier, and the Battle of Tulagi was over. The Tulagi operation was certainly disappointing in terms of ammunition expended to results obtained, said Admiral Nimitz, who took this opportunity to emphasise the necessity for target practice at every opportunity. At any later period of the war their performance would have been laughable, but all hands in Task Force 17 were jubilant. They believed they had sunk two destroyers, one freighter and four gunboats, forced a light cruiser ashore, and severely damaged a third destroyer. A second freighter and a seaplane tender may have been a heavy cruiser. In fact, they believed that most of the Japanese fleet headed their way had been destroyed, an illusion that might have been very costly if it had lasted longer. As Fletcher headed south for his next morning rendezvous with Fitch, he signalled Admiral W. W. Smith, ordering him to designate two heavy cruisers to go into Savo Island and clean up the cripples the following dawn. Astoria and Chester were selected, but Admiral Fletcher cancelled this order, fortunately so, for if the two cruisers had carried out the assignment, they would have encountered enemy carriers, and it is unlikely that Poco Smith or Tommy Shock would have lived to tell the tale. When Fletcher's planes hit Tulagi, the Japanese supporting and covering forces were too far away to answer the base commander's call for help. Takagi, commanding the carrier force, did not get the word until about noon when he was just completing fueling north of Bougainville. He made best speed to the southeastward, but by midnight had only reached a position about a hundred miles north of the southern cape of Santa Isabel. Fortunate indeed that Admiral Fletcher had achieved complete surprise, for if any of these Japanese forces had been within striking distance, he could have got no help from Admiral Fitch, who was widening the gap between Fletcher and himself through all three daylight watches. Yorktown, after recovering her planes, started south fast, and met Lexington at the scheduled rendezvous at 8.16 May 5th. Just at the end of the morning watch, one of Yorktown's planes on patrol shot down a Japanese four-engine seaplane which belonged to the 25th Air Flotilla based on Rabaul. Since this air flotilla was not under his command, Admiral Inouye was unaware of this plane's loss or whereabouts. Hence he used most of his planes on the 5th for a bombing attack on Port Moresby. Admiral Fletcher spent the rest of the 5th of May refuelling from Neosho, steaming within visual signalling distance of Admirals Fitch and Crace on a southeasterly course. The ships were well out of the cold front and for two days they enjoyed the perfect weather of tropic seas when fresh trades are blowing from the southeast, force four, fat cumulus clouds rolling along, casting purple shadows on the opalescent coral sea. Task Force 17 was feeling fine. So far as most of the Blue Jackets knew, they had already turned back the Japanese, and Scuttlebutt was full of a forthcoming liberty at Sydney. At 1930, Fletcher changed course to the northwest, assuming correctly that the enemy would be coming out of Rabaul. The Port Moresby Invasion Group and Marumo's Support Group were steaming merrily along on a southerly course, aiming at the Jomard Passage through the Louisiade Archipelago. Meanwhile, Admiral Takagi's striking force was beating down along the outer coast of the Solomons. At 19, May 5th, it rounded San Cristobal, turned west and passed north of Rennell Island, cruising at 25 knots. By dawn, the 6th of May, the enemy carriers were well into the Coral Sea. Goto's covering group began refuelling from Euler IRO at Shortland Island, south of Bougainville, completed it at 8.30 May 6th and again put to sea. Thus, the 5th of May passed peacefully, except for the one plane shot down by Yorktown. Next day, the 6th, was a busy one for all hands, whether Australian, American or Japanese. Everyone was getting a little warmer. Something big was bound to happen soon. At 7.30, Admiral Fletcher decided it was time to place in effect his operation order drawn up on the 1st, integrating Fitch's and Crace's forces with his own into one task force, 17. The order was little more than a repetition of the injunction to destroy enemy ships, shipping and aircraft at favourable opportunities. Fletcher was feeling his way along, 
When the time came, he would see what chips the enemy would put on the table and react accordingly. He intended to delegate the tactical command during air operations to Admiral Fitch, who was an experienced carrier sailor. But by some oversight, Fitch was never notified of this until immediately before the action on the 8th of May. Meanwhile, Commander G. H. de Bourne in Tender Tangier, who had charge of the PBY search group in Noumea, was doing his best. But he had only twelve Catalinas, and they were too far away to search the Solomons, to the westward and northwestward. Their scope was limited by military punctilio, the demarcation line between the South Pacific and Southwest Pacific areas. The western three-quarters of the Coral Sea were supposed to be searched by United States Army planes based in Australia, but it was physically impossible for them to do it. And as Fletcher was operating on the MacArthur side of the demarcation line, he had to supplement land-based air search by reconnaissance flights of his own carrier-based planes. Throughout these two days, Fletcher was receiving reports from Brisbane and Pearl Harbor of a large number of enemy ships of practically every type, including three carriers, south of the Solomons. But only by the afternoon of the 6th was it possible for intelligence to make any sense out of them. Fletcher's staff then confirmed the Admiral's hunch that the Port Moresby invasion group would turn the corner of New Guinea through Jomard Passage after establishing a forward seaplane base in the Louisiades, and that they would come through next day or the 8th, if not stopped. The Admiral, who had spent a good part of the 6th fueling, cut it short, since in so doing he had to head into the southeast wind, away from the enemy. At 19.30, May 6th, he resumed his former course to the northwestward in order to be within striking distance of the Port Moresby invasion group by daylight May 7th. But as Allied intelligence had but fragmentary knowledge of the movements of Takagi's big carriers, owing to inadequate land-based air search, Fletcher had no knowledge of them, no apprehension of the Japanese plan of envelopment. The Japanese striking force had changed from a northwesterly to a due south course at 9.30 May 6th and was dropping right down on Fletcher's line of advance, but that he did not know. His morning plane search that day turned back just short of the Japanese carriers, and the afternoon search too missed them because Takagi was still under an overcast. So Yorktown and Lexington plodded along on their northwesterly course, unobserving and unobserved. By midnight, the 6th of May, they had reached a point about 310 miles from Des Moines Island, off the tail end of the New Guinea bird, where the Japanese had established a temporary seaplane anchorage to cover their advance. Admiral Takagi continued on his southerly course until the second dog watch, when he too had to fuel. At that moment, he was only 70 miles distant from Admiral Fletcher, but each was unaware of the other's presence. As nearly as can be ascertained, Takagi ordered no long-range searches on either 5 or the 6th of May, an amazing omission. Had he done so on the afternoon of the 6th, he would have caught Fletcher fueling, a tough spot for any sailor, and in the bright sunlight at that. Moreover, a failure in communications lost him a wonderful opportunity to catch the American flattops flat-footed. At about the 1st of May 6, a Japanese search plane from Rabaul reported Fletcher's position correctly, but Takagi never got the word until too late. So, when he turned north against the light evening breeze to fuel, he was opening range on Fletcher, although closing the Port Moresby invasion group which it was his job to protect. The main action of the Battle of the Coral Sea should have been fought on the 6th of May, and would have been if each force had been aware of the other's presence. Nevertheless, the 6th day of May did not pass without incident. At 10.30, Four flying fortresses of the 19th Bombardment Group from Cloncurry, staging through Port Moresby, dropped 12 explosives at Shoho of Goto's covering group, then about 60 miles south of Bougainville. Although the carrier had no planes in the air, the bombs fell so wide that she was able to launch Zeeks, which drove off the B-17s. Around noon, more Allied planes sighted Goto, then heading south looking for trouble and at 13 they located the Port Moresby invaders not far south of Rabaul. Takagi had radio intelligence of what was going on. Inouye now knew that two of his forces had been sighted, estimated that Fletcher was about 500 miles to the southeast of the Japanese forces, then moving into the Louisiades, and expected him to attack next day, the 7th. So, at 1520 May 6th, Inouye directed all operations to continue according to plan. 
By midnight, the Port Moresby-bound transports were closing Misima Island, almost ready to slip through Jomard Pass. Marumo, who had reached that position well ahead of them, dropped the seaplane carrier Kamikawa Maru and retired to the northwestward, up near the Dontracasto Islands. Goto, in the meantime, was protecting the left flank of the Port Moresby invaders, Shobo furnishing the combat air patrol until sundown at 1815. Four hours later, this light carrier changed course to the WSW for next morning's agreed launching position. By midnight, she was about 90 miles northeast of Des Moines Island, where Kamikawa Maru was ready to fly next day's air search. This was the day, the 6th of May, that marked the low point of the war for American arms. General Wainwright was forced to surrender his forces in the Philippines. But on the very next day, there opened a new and brighter chapter in the Pacific War. The time had come for the Allies to take their first step forward. The transition from Corregidor to Coral Sea is startling, dramatic, and of vast importance. When Euler Neosho and destroyer Sims were detached from Fletcher's task force at 1755 May 6th, they headed south for Point Rye, their next fueling rendezvous, and arrived there about 8.10 next morning. Two planes were observed some ten miles away, carrier planes evidently, and ours hopefully. Unfortunately, they were Haras of Takagi's striking force. That force, as we have seen, reversed course to the northward on the evening of the 6th of May and maintained it until two hours after midnight, when it turned again and headed south. Since as yet Admiral Takagi had no knowledge of the position of any Allied naval force, he decided on Hara's recommendation to make a thorough search southward in order to make sure no carriers were behind him when he moved westward to provide cover for the Port Moresby invasion group. At 6 May 7th the search went out. Hara, as he ruefully admitted after the war, was quite pleased with himself at the time for making this change, as by so doing his planes located what they reported as the United States carrier force at the eastern edge of the search sector. In the end, it did not prove to be a fortunate decision. Nor was it fortunate for the poor tanker and her single-stack escort destroyer Sims. One of the Japanese search planes reported them at 7.36 as a carrier and a cruiser, a compliment to Neosho and Sims, which, if known, would not have been appreciated. Hara accepted this evaluation 100%, promptly ordered an all-out heavy shelling and torpedo attack, and closed distance. Sims was patrolling about a mile ahead of Neosho shortly after nine when a single plane appeared and dropped an explosive nearby. Both ships went to general quarters. Half an hour later, 15 high-level bombers dropped, missed and disappeared. At 10.38, another group of ten made a horizontal bombing attack on Sims, which swung hard right and avoided nine explosives dropped simultaneously. About noon, her number came up when 36 dive bombers arrived, Sims went to flank speed and turned left to take position on Neosho's port quarter. The planes, aiming for carrier Neosho, came in from astern in three waves. Sims fired away as best she could, but one of her four 20mm guns jammed early, and her main battery accounted for only one plane. Three 500-pound explosives hit the destroyer, two exploded in her engine room, and within a few minutes she buckled amidships and sank stern first. All hands began to abandon ship. Just as the sea reached the top of the single stack, a terrific explosion occurred. What remained of the ship was lifted 10 to 15 feet out of the water. A smaller explosion from depth charges followed. Chief Signalman R. J. Dickin began picking up the few survivors with a damaged whaleboat which the sailors had managed to cut loose. He found only 15 men alive. In the meantime, 20 dive bombers concentrated on the Fat Lady, as Neosho had been nicknamed by the sailors of the fighting ships that she fed. Within a few minutes, they scored seven direct hits and eight near misses, one by a self-destructor who exploded against number four gun station. Gasoline burst from the plane's tanks and flowed blazing along the deck. Captain Phillips ordered all hands to make preparations to abandon ship and stand by. That order does not mean all hands jump over the side, but that is what a number of sailors did. They had just seen Sims blow up and sink. Two whaleboats and some rafts were lowered or thrown overboard, and a considerable number of the premature evacuees were brought back on board, but many were drowned, and others who had climbed onto rafts drifted away as night fell over the Coral Sea. And it was a rough night for rafts. These men paid dearly for their lack of discipline, 
yet many would have been saved but for a bad mistake by the ship's navigator, a lieutenant who shall remain nameless here, although what he did must be inserted as a cautionary tale for young naval officers. During a lull in the engagement, this officer took a fix from the Sun and Venus, but plotted it wrong. As a result of this error, search for survivors did not commence at the proper point. For four days, 7 to the 11th of May, Neosho drifted westerly before the trades. All hands were frantically trying to keep her afloat. The deceased were buried, and the wounded cared for as well as conditions allowed. Admiral Leary ordered the PBYs based on tender Tangier at Noumea to search for survivors, and early on the 9th sent out destroyer Henley to rescue any floaters reported by the Catalinas and take off the rest of Neosho's crew. Owing to the navigator's mistake, they had the devil's own time accomplishing their mission. The oiler was picked up only about noon the 11th of May by a PBY. She reported to Henley, and that afternoon the destroyer took off the 123 men still on board and scuttled poor fat lady. Henley searched for floating survivors the rest of that day and the next, with no luck, and on the 12th headed for Brisbane, so that the seriously wounded might have better medical attention than a destroyer could provide. By this time Captain Phillips had replotted the position of the air attack, and destroyer Helm took up the search. On the 17th of May, three days out of Noumea, she found a raft with four men alive, last survivors of 68 men in four life rafts that had kept together. This high mortality, excessive for a raft voyage of ten days in tropic seas, was largely due to carelessness and poor discipline. After several such experiences in 1942, the Navy improved the design and equipment of life rafts and provided all hands with rough directions for raft navigation. Sims and Fat Lady did not die in vain. If they had not drawn off this strike, Hara's planes might have found and attacked Fletcher on the 7th when the American planes were working over Shoho. In the end, this operation caused Hara much chagrin and cost him half a dozen of his precious carrier planes. Admiral Fletcher, when not fueling, steered northwesterly for almost 36 hours until, at 6.25 May 7th, he reached a point about 115 miles due south of Rossell Island, easternmost of the Louisiad archipelago which trails off from New Guinea like detached tail feathers. Twenty minutes later, when the sun rose, he turned north. At the same time, he ordered Admiral Crace's support group to push ahead, on the same northwesterly course parallel to and south of the Louisiades, and attack the Port Moresby invasion group which reconnaissance planes reported to be heading for Jomard Passage, with the obvious intention of whipping into Port Moresby. Fletcher later explained that he had detached Crace because he expected an air duel with enemy carriers and wished to ensure that the Japanese invasion would be thwarted, even if they finished him. But if Takagi had stopped Fletcher, Crace's ships would probably have been chewed up too, and by sending Crace chasing westward, Fletcher weakened his already exiguous anti-aircraft screen and lessened his chances of checking Takagi. Conversely, if Fletcher won the carrier battle, he would be in a position to break up the Port Moresby invasion group, even if they did turn the corner. Possibly this diversion served the good purpose of puzzling the enemy and causing him to concentrate his land-based air on Crace's cruisers instead of Fletcher's carriers, but it was only by a special dispensation of Providence that the support group escaped a fatal heavy shelling. Rear Admiral Crace R.N., Characterised by his American screen commander as an excellent seaman and gallant gentleman who accepted the United States ships into his command with warmth, affection and admiration for their efficiency, assumed a diamond-shaped anti-aircraft formation and steamed on at 25 knots. He had not gone far when, at 8.10, Chicago sighted a twin-float monoplane swooping around maddeningly, just out of gun range. United States Army reconnaissance planes from Australia were sighted by the support group at 9.40 and again at 11.36. At 13.58, when the group had reached a point south and a little west of Jomard Pass, it was attacked by 11 single-engine land-based planes. All ships opened fire and drove them off. Immediately after, radar picked up 12 Sallies Type 96, two-engine land-based Navy bombers 75 miles away. Crace ordered radical manoeuvres, and every ship opened fire as the planes came in low. Eight aerial torpedoes were dropped, but all missed, and five of the bombers were shot down. 
immediately after the surviving torpedo planes had retired, 19 high-flying sallies dropped their steel eggs from an altitude of 15,000 to 20,000 feet. The ships dodged the bombs as they had the torpedoes, and the planes flew away. Within a few minutes, more trouble developed from an unexpected source. Three bombers jumped Farragut and narrowly missed her. Observations by the attacked destroyer, confirmed by photographs taken by the planes themselves, proved beyond possibility of doubt that they were B-17s of the United States Army Air Force from Townsville. Admiral Crace, somewhat upset, complained to Admiral Leary, who replied that he had plans to improve Army recognition of naval vessels. But the Army Air Commander under General MacArthur insisted that there had been no bombing of Crace's force, declined the plans and prohibited further discussion of the matter. By midnight, Admiral Crace had reached a position about 120 miles south of the New Guinea bird's tail. He continued on his westerly course part of the night, and then, having heard that the Port Moresby invaders had turned back, headed south and retired to Australia. Crace's chase may have served no useful purpose, but it was far from inglorious. It proved, as the Abda command never did, that ships of two nations could be made into an excellent tactical unit. And, as the Japanese attack was of the same type and strength as the one that sank His Majesty's ship, Prince of Wales and Repulse, on the 10th of December 1941, the escape of the support group without a single hit is a tribute to its training and to the high tactical competence of its commander. The Japanese, strangely enough, thought they had bettered the score of the 10th of December. They claimed having sunk an Augusta-class cruiser Chicago and a California-class battleship Australia, and having torpedoed another battleship like His Majesty's ship Warspite. Apparently, Chicago doubled for her too, since in the later Battle of Sydney, she was again reported to be Warspite. Ship recognition comes hard to the fly-fly boys of every nation. Let those who have tried it from 10,000 feet without previous training cast the first stone. While the planes of Takagi's powerful striking force were beating Neosho and Sims and Marumo's support group was herding the Port Moresby invaders toward Jomard Pass. Goto's covering group, four heavy cruisers and light carrier Shoho continued on its WSW course until 7, May 7th, when it headed southeast into the wind to launch four reconnaissance planes. Half an hour later, Shobo launched an additional five planes to cover the Port Moresby invasion group, then about 30 miles to the southwestward. Admiral Fletcher, after detaching Admiral Crace at 6.45 May 7th, changed course to the northward and launched a search mission. The first important contact, made by a Yorktown plane at 8.15, reported two carriers and four heavy cruisers, about 175 miles to the northwestward, other side of the Louisiades. Fletcher naturally took this to be the striking force and pressed forward, eager to attack. Lexington began launching at 9.26 when she had reached a point about 160 miles southeast of the two carriers and four cruisers, reported at 0815. Yorktown followed suit half an hour later. 93 planes were airborne by 10.30. 47 were left for reserve and combat air patrol. The force had now re-entered the cold front. A gusty wind blew from the southeast and cloud cover increased, although it never became so thick as to hamper launching and recovery. But Goto was out in the broad sunlight, and his position was near enough to the reported one of the two carriers to serve very well. No sooner had Yorktown's attack group been launched than her scout planes returned. It was then discovered that owing to an improper arrangement of the pilot's code contact pad, their reported two carriers and four heavy cruisers at 8.15 should have read two heavy cruisers and two destroyers. They had not seen Takagi's force or even Goto's, but Marumo then composed of two antique light cruisers screened by two or three converted gunboats. Admiral Fletcher's all-out strike had been launched against these feeble ships, in a direction at right angles to that from which the two big Japanese carriers were approaching him. He was in a serious predicament, particularly since his location was well known to the enemy. Japanese planes had been trailing the United States carriers and reporting to Rabaul. At 8.30, Goto knew exactly where Fletcher was and reported his position to Shobo, which promptly prepared for an attack. Other enemy aircraft in the meantime sighted Crace's cruisers pressing westward. 
The first effect of these contacts, fortunately for Fletcher, and he needed a bit of luck at this point, was to make Admiral Inouye anxious for the safety of his transports. At nine, Inouye ordered the Port Moresby invasion group to turn away instead of entering Jomard Pass. He wished to keep it out of harm's way until Fletcher and Crace were properly handled. But as it turned out, the 9th of May 7 marked the nearest that this or any other Japanese naval force got to Port Moresby. Commander W. B. Alt's attack group from Lexington, well ahead of the Yorktown Plains, passed Tagula Island, biggest of the Louisiades, about 11. Shortly thereafter, Lieutenant Commander W. L. Hamilton, in one of the scout planes of the attack group, flying at 15,000 feet, had the great good luck to sight one carrier, two or three heavy cruisers, and one or two destroyers, 25 to 30 miles on his starboard hand. These were Shoho and the rest of Goto's covering group. Goto, about the same time, sighted him and began evasive action as Commander Alt with his two wing planes went in for the first attack. A couple of Zeeks tried unsuccessfully to intercept. The three Americans made no direct hits, but scored at least one near miss, which blew five planes from Shoho's flight deck over the side. Hamilton's ten SBDs attacked at 11.10. Lexington's torpedo squadron followed seven minutes later, and Yorktown's air group piled in at 11.25. Ninety-three planes against one light carrier. No ship could have survived such a concentration. After receiving two 1,000-pound bomb hits, she burst into flames and went dead in the water. More hits followed, and by 11.30 the entire vessel was damaged by bombs, torpedoes and self-exploded enemy planes, records the Shoho War Diary. Abandon ship was ordered at 11.31 and the carrier sank within five minutes. About 160 miles to the southeastward, the radio rooms of Yorktown and Lexington were packed with anxious audiences, for this was the very first attack by American carrier planes on an enemy carrier. Static was bad, and the snatches of pilots' conversation that came over did not tell much. Suddenly the squawking ceased, and over the voice radio, sharp and strong, came the voice of Lexington's second SBD leader, Lieutenant Commander R. E. Dixon. Scratch one flat top, Dixon to carrier, scratch one flat top. All but three American planes were safely on board by 1338. Goto retired to the northeastward. Covering group now comprised one destroyer and four heavy cruisers, whose float planes were ordered to Des Moines Island, where the seaplane carrier Kamikawa Maru of Marumo's support group was anchored. By 1450 May 7th, Yorktown and Lexington were ready to launch a second strike, but Admiral Fletcher wisely decided against it. He estimated that Shoho's consorts were not worth it. He had not yet located Shokaku and Zuikaku, and through radar contacts and radio interceptions of Japanese carrier plane reports he knew that his own position was known to the enemy. Nor did it seem wise to search for the big flat tops, because flying conditions worsened and visibility decreased during the afternoon. Even if Takagi's striking force were located, there would hardly be enough daylight left for strike and recovery. So Fletcher decided to rely upon shore-based aircraft to locate Takagi, and steamed to the westward during the night of seven the 8th of May. He estimated that the Port Moresby invasion group would thread the Jomard Pass next morning, not knowing that his own approach and Crace's chase had caused timid Inouye to recall them. Takagi's initiative changed this American plan. Twelve bombers and fifteen torpedo planes took off from Shokaku and Zuikaku at 16.30 to look for Fletcher, with orders to attack at sundown if they located him. Owing to the squally weather, they found nothing, and were returning when intercepted by Yorktown and Lexington fighter planes. In the ensuing series of dogfights, nine Japanese planes were shot down at the cost of two Wildcats and Lieutenant Paul G. Baker, one of the most able and beloved pilots in the Navy. Some of these Japanese planes laid a course for home right over the American carriers, which they mistook for their own. At 19, 45 minutes after sunset, Three enemy planes were sighted on Yorktown's starboard beam, blinking in Morse code on Aldis lamps, and the carrier obligingly blinked back. They were recognised and fired on as they crossed the flagship's bow, yet they managed to escape. Twenty minutes later, three more tried to join Yorktown's landing circle and one was shot down. As Japanese carriers at this time had neither radar nor homing devices, and the American radio telephone inadvertently jammed the frequency used by their aircraft, 
preventing the pilots from getting a bearing on their carriers. Hara had to turn on his searchlights so the planes could find their way home. In the ensuing night recovery, eleven planes splashed, and the remaining six or seven were not recovered until twenty-one. At 19.30, Lexington's radar showed enemy planes orbiting in what appeared to be a landing circle only thirty miles to the eastward. Fitch attempted to pass the word to Fletcher in Yorktown, but there was a foul-up in communications, and the task force commander did not get it until 22. He received the report very dubiously. Yorktown's radar had given no such indication, and, assuming evaluation to be correct, Hara's carriers would be somewhere else by midnight. Actually, at the 22nd of May 7, they were about 95 miles to the eastward of the American carriers. Fletcher considered detaching a cruiser destroyer force for a night attack on Takagi, but decided against it. The last quarter moon would not afford much light through thick scudding clouds, and the destroyers were needed for anti-submarine protection at night, urgently so for anti-aircraft protection at daybreak. All things considered, he reported, the best plan seemed to be to keep our force concentrated and prepare for a battle with enemy carriers next morning. It is a curious fact that Inouye too contemplated night action and later thought better of it. He ordered Goto's cruisers and Kajioka's destroyer screen to leave the transports, rendezvous east of Russell Island and make a night attack on Allied forces, whether Crases or Fletchers he failed to specify. But before midnight Inouye cancelled this plan, ordered the Port Moresby landing delayed two days, directed two of Goto's cruisers to join Takagi's striking force and Goto's other ships to close the invasion transports heading back to Rabaul. The Japanese retreat had begun, although nobody yet admitted the fact. Admiral Takagi, too, was toying with the idea of night action to retrieve the disgrace of his failure so far. The few planes recovered from his 27-plane flight reported two carriers about 40 or 60 miles away, an estimate almost as poor as the one Fletcher had on him. On board flagship Miyoko, Takagi discussed with his staff a possible night attack. He had but two heavy cruisers and six destroyers to protect him, and knew not what Fletcher had. His pilots were tired out from their protracted searches. Before any decision had been reached, Rear Admiral Koso Abe, who commanded the retreating Port Moresby transport unit, requested Hara to close and provide air cover, now that Shoho was sunk. The carrier commander had other ideas for the employment of his air strength, yet complied because, as he said after the war, I had my basic mission to fulfil, which was to protect the transports. At about twenty-two, when all his surviving planes had been recovered, Hara headed north, and by midnight was in, opening range on Fletcher, who about the same time changed course to the southeastward. Neither commander knew what the other was doing that night, but each was thirsty for the other's blood. Before long, both would be gratified.